Okay. So hopefully we have seen that entropy and enthalpy don't always agree about spontaneity. This is a problem. How do we know which one to listen to? And the answer is they both matter. Not quite equally, but they bo do both matter. And so the first person to figure out how we can marry these two very different ideas together uh, was Gibbs. And we call this Gibbs free energy, which has the symbol Delta G, capital G. And so also in your textbook appendix C, we have a listing in the middle of Delta G standard values, okay? So Gibbs free energy is the, the one way to determine spontaneity. It considers enthalpy and entropy and temperature all at one time, okay? And bonus, it's even a relatively straightforward equation. <laughs> So when we were talking about ammonium nitrate and we said the endothermic reaction generally doesn't happen at room temperature, ammonium nitrate does dissolve. So that's a thing that happens. The explanation is that the entropy increases so much that the reaction is spontaneous even though enthalpy is positive. Okay, so it's a balancing act, right? And delta G helps us to quantify that. Um, we also have reactions where there's a decrease in entropy. So like sodium chloride formation. So you get Cl2 plus Na and it forms NaCl. That happens, absolutely happens. You can't even find chlorine in nature because it's so reactive anyway. Same thing with sodium, but you definitely find sodium chloride all over the place. That must mean it's a spontaneous reaction, even though going from, what would it be? It would be three particles, two NAs, one Cl2, into just two particles shouldn't be favored by entropy, two particles of NaCl. they have a really, really, really high enthalpy of formation. So that means it compensates for the decrease in entropy, right? And so we can see both situations happening. I'm just gonna jot down this equation in case it confused you just by talking about it verbally. Oops. So the formation of salt works like this. You get sodium plus chlorine, and you're gonna get NaCl, of course. There's two chlorine because it's diatomic. So I got to do that daily and then I got to do this daily and then it's this and it's one of those like that, right? So the delta H of forming salts is really, really high. These are really hot reactions. Um, even though entropy is negative, they still happen. So Josiah Villard Gibbs comes up with the equation to explain it all. It considers enthalpy delta H, it considers entropy, and it considers temperature. All of these different factors come together in one handy equation. So here it is. You'll notice it says isothermal, meaning the temperature is consistent, right? We're not heating, cooling, or anything crazy like that. Gibbs free energy equals enthalpy minus the temperature times entropy. Now, I just want to remind you of something really, really important here. It's so important, I'm going to write it in, in burgundy, okay? So the units of Gibbs free energy from your textbook are in kilojoules per mole, okay? Enthalpies are listed in kilojoules per mole also. Entropies are listed in joules per mole Kelvin. Now the Kelvin goes away, that's why you multiply temperature times Kelvin. But the part that doesn't is that you have joules and kilojoules. You cannot subtract units that don't match. It'd be like if I gave you $2 and I said, pay me two quarters and you go, oh, now I have $0. That's not true, right? You would have six quarters left. You have to convert the units so they all match. I don't care if you convert kilojoules into joules or if you convert joules into kilojoules. I don't care, but you must convert before you subtract. Remember that. Write that down. Star it. Circle it. Put a big sticker 
by it or something. Okay, so here's what delta G tells us. Here's the meaning, all right? And as always with thermodynamics, it's about the sign. If delta G is negative, the reaction will be spontaneous under those conditions. If delta G is zero, the reaction is an equilibrium. And if the delta G is positive, the reaction is not spontaneous under those conditions. Those are the only two options. Either the reaction happens or it happens a little bit, or it doesn't happen at all, okay? Now, just a note, we said earlier, if something has, uh, is non-spontaneous in the direction it's written, the reverse reaction is spontaneous, right? So the opposite thing can happen. So frequently we see diagrams that show us spontaneity, all right? So if we have just reactants in the Haber-Bosch process, the reaction in the forward direction will be spontaneous. You can think of that just like we were when we talked about kinetics and equilibrium. You have more of the nitrogen and hydrogen, they're gonna collide with each other. So the rate forward will be much, much, much faster than the rate backward, right? So spontaneous in the forward direction. On the other hand, if we have all ammonia, that means N2 and H2 can't run into each other, there isn't any. If we have all ammonia, that's when entropy takes over. Ammonia has a lower entropic value than um, having the nitrogen and hydrogen separate because four particles versus two. So entropy says, mm, no, we don't want to stay all ammonia. So the reverse reaction would become faster than the forward reaction. Until we get to a balancing point, and this point is known as the lowest delta G possible, the lowest free energy for this system. That's where equilibrium occurs and the lowest delta G value, the lowest absolute value of delta G is zero. So that's what we mean when we see, say that an equilibrium is going to happen when delta G is zero, okay? So in other words, positive for the delta G forward reaction, Sorry, that was wrong. <laughs> a negative delta G in the forward reaction, which means a positive delta G for the reverse reaction here when we have too many reactants. And over here, when we have too many products, we have a negative delta G for the reverse reaction, but a positive delta G for the forward reaction until you get to a balancing point. This is the magical equation that you can use to answer my question about combustion. All you need to know is the delta G value for combustion in the forward direction versus a reverse direction. And tell me under what conditions can you get delta G equal to zero? That's when it would be an equilibrium. So to calculate delta G, we have Gibbs free energy, which you can use enthalpy and entropy and the temperature. That's handy when you're not at standard conditions, when it's not 298 Kelvin, right? Um, but it still assumes that the concentrations and the pressures are all standard, okay? Similarly, our textbook lists Gibbs free energy in the center column of Appendix C. That's also 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere of pressure and one molar concentrations of stuff. But we can use Hess's law here too, products minus reactants, all right? And so you can go do that for the combustion reaction. Here's your standard conditions, by the way, right? Delta G for an element is zero, just like delta H is, as long as it's in its natural state, like hydrogen is gas. Delta G also connects back to a concept from chapter five, which is work, all right? Um, gasoline makes an excellent way to move our vehicles because it has a very large, very negative delta G. That means it can do a lot of work to turn your wheels and power your car. Another kind of battery that has been investigated for powering cars and various things is, is one that's based on oxygen and hydrogen. It's called a hydrogen fuel cell. And it produces water, which would be great. No pollution, right? The question is, is it possible? So before a chemist does any kind of reaction they think might work, we need to know whether the thermodynamics are behind us or not. 
you always do a Gibbs free energy calculation. If you find out it's not with you, then you better find a different reaction or you better change the conditions. All right. So in your learning check, calculate delta H and calculate delta S. And then use them to plug into our equation for delta G. Don't forget to change the units. And we're going to show all the work for both of these calculations and this one. Now a little bit about signs. Um, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, that's good, all right? So this is the most spontaneous situation you can have. It's favored by entropy increasing and enthalpy decreasing, both good things. So when entropy is decreasing, that means the term minus T delta S will be negative. So you end up negative, negative, you get a bigger negative. So an example of that is ozone degrading down to O2. That is spontaneous no matter what the temperature is, which is fantastic because it's pretty darn cold up in our atmosphere. And that has to happen. <laughs> if enthalpy is positive, it is not favored, and entropy is negative, also not favored. Our negative T delta S term is positive. So you end up with a positive plus positive. It means it never happens under any conditions. O2 gas never forms ozone. That's not the reaction that happens. It has to go through NO actually to form uh, ozone. And usually lightning is involved. All right, and so if we have a negative enthalpy and a negative entropy, we end up with a positive T delta S because negative of a negative is positive. And so if we have a negative here and a positive here, the answer of delta G will depend on how big temperature is. If you have a low temperature, this term is too small to overcome the negative delta H, so it will be spontaneous. If you're at a high temperature, the second term here becomes so big, it overcomes the negative delta H and you end up with a positive delta G, which would be non-spontaneous. So I want you to kind of think about what that means when we were talking about Le Chatelier's principle and how heat is involved, right? So if it's spontaneous at low temperatures, right? We want heat to go down. So if this was an endothermic reaction and heat goes down, the reaction shifts to the left. So that would be an example of not spontaneous at low temperatures. But if, uh, if heat goes down here in an exothermic reaction, then the reaction shifts forward. So usually this kind of situation is an exothermic reaction. You have a negative delta H, meaning it's exothermic, uh, and the entropy is increasing. So this is kind of like melting, okay? Now, if we have a positive delta H and a positive delta S, so en enthalpy does not like to be positive for spontaneity, but entropy does. Your negative T delta S ends up negative. The sign of delta G, so positive, negative, the actual sign of delta G depends on having, um, if T is high, it will be spontaneous because it is entropically favored. Temperature high, entropy favors that. For something that's non-spontaneous, uh, it will mean that the T is little. So you have a positive number. This is not big enough to overcome the positive number. So you end up with a positive delta G, okay? Those are all the types of situations. Now, what if we don't have standard conditions? What if it's not a 298 Kelvin? What if it's not a pure solid? Or what if it's not one atmosphere? What if any of these things aren't true? What do we do? Well, we have an equation for that, okay? So Gibbs free energy under non-standard. So no little degree sign. The degree sign always means standard. So delta G under any conditions is standard delta G plus RTLN of Q. And this Q is our friend from the equilibrium chapter. Remember, we defined it as products over reactants. And it doesn't have to be at equilibrium. It might be, but it doesn't have to be. So it's not quite the same thing as Q. Okay. So whatever your conditions are, you can put in the temperature, the, the temperature, the ideal gas constant, 
and whatever your ratio of products and reactants is, and you can figure out whether it's spontaneous in those exact conditions or not. All right. It's important to notice that the gas constant you're using here is not the 0.08206. This is the one for energy. So it's got to be in terms of joules because, you know, delta G is joules. We also have the situation here where this is kilojoules per mole. You're going to end up with joules over here. Fix it. Don't add two things that don't match. Okay. So if we are at equilibrium, this equation simplifies a teensy weensy bit. You can... Um, You know that the delta G is going to be equal to zero if it's at equilibrium, because that's our definition. So you can actually use this in two ways. You can use it just like this. Okay, maybe you need to solve for the K. You could do that. You know that G is zero. You can find the delta G standard from the textbook, and um, you could find K. Or if you have a K, you could find the temperature at which that was done, the temperature at which it would be at equilibrium. Okay. Another uh, way to use it is by realizing, well, this whole term here equals zero. So if, if I subtract RTLNK, I'll get delta G standard equals the gas constant times the temperature times the K value. We have a huge list of K values in Appendix D. So we can find the delta G values of a bunch of acids and bases and KSPs using this formula here, which is quite handy. If I'm trying to solve for K, I'll do the math for you. We rearrange this puppy so that you get K by itself and you can find delta G standard from the textbook appendix C, products minus reactants again. And of course, remembering R is this version. And so you can plug it in, you can get the K. When we think about K and how delta G are related, if we have a very positive delta G value, remember that that means non-spontaneous. And a negative large value means spontaneous. And zero means equilibrium, right? So under the ideal conditions we have here, things that are non-spontaneous have really, really low K values. That means the forward reaction hardly happens at all. Things at equilibrium have an equal proportion under the, you know, whatever temperature you're at. And things that are very, very negative and large delta G values have really high K values, meaning mostly you get products, okay? So this connects with kinetics, it connects with equilibrium, it connects with virtually everything we've learned actually, because thermodynamics is fundamental. So now for the fuel cell reaction, so we're gonna, we're gonna use that same equation so I just copied it on over. Um, if we had a higher temperature, it was we're running at room temperature, most engines don't, so we pick a higher temperature, and the pressures are not just one atmosphere, what do we do? Um, so this is the original equation from the other page, and this has a note, has the reaction itself changed? So when we change the temperature, are we changing the phase of anything? And of course the answer is yes, we are. Liquid water only happens below 100 Celsius. 1,000 Celsius is obviously hotter. So this is no longer a liquid, which will change our thermodynamics. So it's important to get that right before we jump in. OK? Now, um, we have pressures here. So we can calculate a QP. We don't know if it's at equilibrium. Um, but we can calculate a QP, which is mathematically the same thing as a KP, right? And so it's going to be products over reactants. Oh, these are, I, I wrote concentrations. I meant pressures, right? So the pressure of the water, one atmosphere, that's squared, divided by H2 is three atmospheres, and O2 is two atmospheres. So our Q here, so it's 0 0.055555, whatever. I'm going to go 5.6, right? That's the pressure that we're using. Um, so our equation for non-standard conditions, oops, here we go. Non-standard conditions is this times the standard plus RTLNK. 
Q, right? So now I have the Q, except that's the pressure one. And we need to remember that pressure and concentration are not identical to each other. So we probably need to go back and figure out the equation to convert them. So here it is. I found it for you. We just calculated a QP. The relationship is QP equals QC times RT delta N. Remember K and K is assuming at equilibrium, but Q is assuming we don't know. So we're going to use the same equation here. So we know that it's 0 0.56 and it's going to be equal to something. Well, let's call it Q actually. It's going to be our QC is what we're looking for. That's our reaction quotient. And so the, uh, the ideal gas constant with atmospheres goes here. Times the temperature, which of course is 1,000 Celsius, but it's actually 1273 Kelvin. Times the delta N. Remember, this is the, the gas particles, right? So we have two in the product side and three in the reactant side. So your delta N, I'm actually going to do it down here. Delta N is equal to two minus three. Don't be afraid of the negative one. It just is, okay? Um, so there we are with our equation. Our answer is going to be, you know, just don't forget to include the negative one here, exponent, but solve this, divide, and you get your answer. So we end up with a QC, a reaction quotient, is 5.85. I rounded. So now we can put this into our equation here. Ah, oh, no, we can't. We need to find the standard Gibbs free energy. So again, that's the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. So I'm going to go to the back of the textbook. All right, you should really try this on your own. Make sure you're picking the right values, but we're going to Appendix C for this. And so I'm going to write these. Oxygen is going to be zero because it's the element O2 gas. Same thing for hydrogen. H2O gas is not going to have a value of zero. It's listed in a funky place. It's with the oxygen. Um, I don't really know why it's not with hydrogen, but H2O gas has a delta G value of negative 228.57. And that's, of course, kilojoules per mole. So down here we go delta G. Products are two waters minus reactants, which is zero plus two times zero. So of course, minus nothing, right? So we're going to get negative. Four hundred and fifty seven. And that's kilojoules per mole. So now we're ready. Delta G is equal to that number. Plus. This is the one that has joules in it, the R value with joules instead of atmospheres. And then our temperature is still 1273 Kelvin. And it's going to be LN of 5.85. Okay. So now we have to convert the unit. So on the right, the plus term.
We end up with the big number. This whole thing is plus one, eight, six, nine, five, point five joules per mole. Um, I'm going to kind of convert that, right? And so to be able to subtract or actually add these together, I need to go to kilojoules. There's a thousand joules per kilojoule, just like there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. So basically I'm dividing by a thousand. So we get 18.695, so it's 18.7 there. So delta G ends up, oops, trying to change the color here so we can see what's what. Okay, so delta G under non-standard conditions ends up being negative 457.14 plus 18.7 kilojoules per mole. So clearly it's going to happen, right? Because it's, it's very negative. You get a total answer of negative 438.4. All right, so that's a complete non-standard conditions problem. It included standard conditions problem, so um, hopefully you've already done your learning check, but if not, fixed it, right? This is the answer. Um, and so we see that it is a little less spontaneous, but still really, really negative large numbers, so the reaction is going to happen. Here's another reaction that did come up in our discussions of combustion. This is metabolism, right? So um, actually what came up in our discussion is the opposite of metabolism. It was photosynthesis, right? So photosynthesis is when you take CO2 and H2O and you make something out of it, mostly glucose, but other stuff too. So you make a fuel source out of it. And somebody in the discussion said, ah, but that's like the opposite of combustion. And in a lot of ways it is because metabolism is slowly burning something in a controlled way so you can harness the energy of every bond breaking. Well, actually that's wrong. It always costs energy to break bonds. The energy comes back to you when you form simpler molecules like CO2 and H2O. So what you're capturing is the energy of forming lower, lower energy products, right? So you're absorbing all of that and exothermic energy. And you do it in steps when you do metabolism, okay? So this is a big cycle and you do it kind of one little thing at a time, but you're storing the energy in a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And that's just a way of storing energy that once was in glucose in a molecule that can travel all around the, the, the body. Um, and then that energy gets used up, you produce ADP, which is just um, adenosine diphosphate. You break off one of the P's, the phosphate. Um, and by doing that, that energy from breaking, making inorganic phosphate releases energy and it goes to other parts of the cell to making other stuff. All right, so this process is actually a free energy diagram. We're going from glucose to CO2 and H2O. And by doing that, the free energy gets trapped somewhere else, okay? It gets released when we get to simpler molecules like phosphorus by itself, inorganic phosphorus. Um, which is the product, ADP plus inorganic phosphorus plus energy is your product. Um, I could make you calculate the delta G of this process, but I won't. However, if you wanted to use photosynthesis as your argument that combustion can be reversed, you can support that argument by solving for delta G equals zero and finding out what temperature you would need to be at to do that. So these are all the equations for thermodynamics all in one spot for you. This is for calorimetry, two things in contact with each other, transferring heat. These are all the versions of Hess's law. You can calculate Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, entropy. And of course, this is Gibbs equation, okay? And you can also calculate it under non-standard conditions as well as standard conditions at equilibrium. And finally, you can find a K value if you know the standard Gibbs free energy, okay? 
you should spend some time to make a little diagram. Don't look at the formulas. Don't look at your notes. You should be able to do this off the top of your head. And if you can't, give it a good try. And if you can't, go look at your notes and write it down. Wait a little while and go back and do the same thing again. So what you need to be able to do is, is just three things, three pieces of information for each variable. You need to know the symbol. So here we're talking about delta H, delta S, delta G, Q, W, delta E. That's good enough. Maybe K or Q, right? So you want to come up with a symbol. You want to have under your belt what the name of that thing is. And then you want to have an idea of what the units are. The only one that doesn't have units is K. So I'm going to cross that one off. Everything else has units. These are the things you need to be aware of because when you do a problem, that's how you know if you're on the right track or not. Do the units make sense? Do they, do they work? Am I picking the right values from the book? When it says enthalpy, am I picking H? Um, the other thing that's handy for um, everything but Q and K is to think about the sign. So like, for example, if, if H is positive, we call that endothermic. If it's negative, we call it exothermic, okay? Um, for delta G, negative means spontaneous. Positive means non-spontaneous, like that. If Q is negative, we are giving off heat. If Q is positive, we're gaining heat. So this is the process. You want to do the, kind of the same thing for work and energy. You should be able to do it off the top of your head. That's a good sign that you understand how to use these quantities.